It's on. Yes, the mic is on. All right. Well, guys, I oh, it was so hard to make that decision to cut it at that point because there are several stories you didn't get the opportunity to see. So before I call my panel on stage, there are several of the Black Light Project guys who are here tonight, and I saw them come in, and it always brings my heart so much joy whenever I have the opportunity to see them face-to-face, -face, real life and color, because they really became like brothers and sons to me during that process of filming. You really get, there's so much on the cutting room floor that's so good that they talk about their lives. So if they are willing, um, if I could get the guys who were the actual subjects to come up and stand with me, please. There's a couple of them. Tom Mac, you know you one of them. Come on. <laughs> have let's see how many we have. Yeah, we matching. What's up? We didn't even plan it. Yeah. <laughs> come on, come on. Bring the baby. So um, this is Omar, and I'm not sure if we got to your incomplete story during the film. And Omar really has a powerful story that's really cool. So I encourage you, once it is available on YouTube, that you please watch it. And he says something very powerful at the end of how he wants to be seen. And he says, a proud black man. That's how he wants to be seen, and that be okay, to be proud to be black. And we end the film on that because it really spoke to basically, it just summed up in that sentence what we wanted to, for the audience to walk away with. And we did see um, Quayshon in the film, and um, I'm so proud of him because he stepped out um, and started his own business. And I'm just so proud of him. Born Bosses, I have several Born Bosses pieces. So proud of him. He's actually wearing it in the film. And then we have Dave, of course, with his cute little son, so proud of him for serving our country and being dedicated and really, yes. And then, um, of course, Ty Mac. Many of you know Ty Mac, but to be an educator and to hear his story is so amazing, too. Um, to be a dedicated father and a husband and what those things mean to him. So it was just really, really cool. Um, so as you listen, there are several, st couple stories you didn't get to. But please, when it becomes available, watch it. Reflect on it. I hope you were able to see someone that you knew. In that, thank you guys. I won't hold you up any longer. Thank you so much. So we are going to transition to the panel. I also want to say thank you to Jermaine McNair. He's one of the experts. He is the executive director of NC Civil. If you'll stand up. He's also my co-host for Civil Talks. Um, we do a lot of work together. Um, coming to the stage very soon is Reginald Barrett. You can come on up. My panel people, if you'll come on up. Reginald is here tonight. He's going to serve on the panel. And we're going to get started with that um, in just a minute. I'm going to everyone who's going to be on the panel. The seats are assigned. And I want us to really... Um, be able to enjoy the panel. This is my first time moderating. As much as I talk, this is my first time moderating. So I'm gonna kick it off once they get settled. Let me make sure your microphones are on. On the bottom of So, thank you. So, I am going to introduce everyone to you briefly, um, starting at your left, right? Okay. Your left is Dr. Crystal Chambers. She's the interim chair for the Organization of African and African American Faculty. She is an associate professor um, at, at ECU, the Department of Educational Leadership at East Carolina University. We have Mr. Von Derek Walston, and I unfortunately lost the title of your organization. So can you tell me what that is? Uh, definitely. Um, well, I work in the community, and um, I have an organization called Men in Society and Women in Society where I help um, young men and women stay out of jail and help them go to college. Um, I live in a community with a lot of um, kids of my color, and I just go out there, I spend time with them, and um, I just motivate them to be great because um, they don't see that a lot. A lot of them don't have fathers, and I'm just out there like a big brother, and um, I know 
at the end of the day is going to pay off. So that's what I love doing. So Well, you can see why he's on the panel. He's also, he definitely represents our youth. He definitely represents our youth. Um, Major Paula Dance with the Peak County Sheriff's Department. We have... Um, Ty Mac Willis, he is an educator. He's also a small business owner, husband and father. And he, of course, is one of the subjects, as I stated earlier. We have um, Lieutenant Kalinia Thomas. I said it right? Yes. Um, with the Greenville Police Department. Then we have Nisi Jones. She's a marriage and family therapist, doctoral student in medical family therapy at ECU. And finally, we have Reginald Barrett, who is a community organizer and an educator. And again, he is one of our experts in the film. So, I'm going to kick this off with a fun question. Um, and so, what I thought was a fun question is, and I got, want you guys to think about this film also. If you have seen Black Panther by Marvel, directed by Ryan Coogler, who is an African-American male, and starring many black actors and actresses, though it is fiction, what impact do you believe, if any, if any, the film may have on the perception of blacks in the media and in other areas of black reality. And for the panel, just if you feel like you have something to contribute, please do. If you feel like that question, you're not sure if you want to answer that, you do not have to do that. Okay? Well, I'm so glad you asked the question, and thank you for inviting us um, to be here. I actually heard about this project on NPR you know, some months ago. So I'm just really excited about being here. But as for Black Panther, the movie, um, when I first got the list of questions, I immediately thought about the movie because when I'm an academic, so I had to do the ed geek thing and look at what's the research that's out there. And there's a um, report um, by an organization called Open Agenda that did a synthesis of the research literature on black men imagery in media and the things that they recommended, like number one recommendation was for balanced representations of black malehood. And the beauty of Ban Black Panther is it's all there. It's the good, it's the bad, it's the in-between. It's, you know, the guy who's hesitant because, um, you know, he's not really sure how you, he fits into the family scheme. It's, it's the guy who's assertive, the guy who is seeking his father's approval. I mean, it's like all these black men in different images. And I mean, I won't even get into the positive images of black women. I'm, I'm really trying to um, stay off of that. And so when we think about black males um, in the media, I mean, there's just way too much of um, the negative. I mean, it, it's clear in the le research literature and then just what we typically see. Um, but then when we do see positive images, those images are limited to a few genres. And so when we're talking about athletics or musicianship, um, but that doesn't represent the whole of um, black male experiences. And so I love how um, Black Panther just has it all there in, in, in one basket, if you would. And we need more um, films and um, pieces that, that do that for us. Anyone else? Want and to definitely, um, I would like to say something. Um, I feel like that was a great movie because um, it showed that a black man can save the day. And um, my coworkers, they mess with me all the time because I post things about helping black males and they like, I'm fine. You're going to be the Project Panther. Um, they, I mean, they, they try to, they, it's, it's just amazing how in the movie it showed he never gave up. I mean, um, he was, I mean, they thought he died, but he came back. You know, he, he fought hard for his family. It, it, showed, it showed how incredible and magnificent a black male can be. I mean, it didn't show us like in chains. It didn't show us behind bars. It showed us like we actually had sense, like in which we do, you know. So I mean, I really love that movie. Yeah. I'm probably the only person in the world who has not seen that movie. Oh my God! And um, it's just been spoiled for me. But I'm gonna go see it anyway. Okay. So I'm just gonna abstain from this question. <laughs> um, raise a hand if you have not seen the movie. Okay, well, we're going to have a couple of spoilers up here. I'm sorry. But there was a point in time in the movie where um, Black Panther, the son, he was actually bowing down to his father. And <clears throat> the father says, stand up. You are a king.
And in that moment, I was like, wow. And he stood up and looked, he looked his father in his eyes. Imagine if all, all of our young black boys had that male figure to say, hey, stand up. You can do this. You're a king. You are uh, you the bomb.com. Just imagine that moment. But for that movie, it spoke a lot to me, um, especially for the black males. But then when you looked at the representation of the women, Black Panther wouldn't have been with what he was without those, you know, those strong right. black women right. in their lives. So to all the black women out there, I want to say thank you, and especially to my wife and her mother and my mom. Without you guys, I wouldn't be the man that I am now. And I think the movie also represents that, too. We need y'all just as much as y'all need us. Anyone else want to take that on? Uh, for me, Black Panther uh, represents community. Uh, when I looked at that movie, uh, I think I was enthralled by the fact that I saw all different types of black people coming together for a common cause or whatever that cause was. And because I love community, Black Panther inspired me to love community even the more. When I left there, I was excited about what new developments we could come together and, and do and set up so that we could, you know, move our community forward because oftentimes we are seen in such a pessimistic manner that when it comes, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, you're like, oh, wait, you know, are we really our brothers and sisters keepers? But when, when I saw Black Panther, I saw us collectively working together for a common cause. So I left there thinking about you, you and you, thinking about community and how we can build a better community together. That was so good. And I hate to piggyback off of it, but I am. Um, <laughs> Reggie and I are like adopted brothers and sisters. This is amazing. But um, so when you said the thing about black women and black men and things like that, if you took notice of the Black Light Project, what we did um, is all black males, right? But it's voiced by a black woman. And that's just that message we're sending. We see you. We need you. We're here for you. And it's kind of an exchange that happens. And when I see Black Panther, I think that some of the internalized things that have happened in the black community, like we've internalized some of the messages we've gotten, and having Black Panther, I think, helps us to look at ourselves like, okay, Wakanda's not real, but Wakanda forever, you know? <laughs> you know? And I, it made me feel like, like a sense of unity and a sense of we have so much to offer, and I can now look at the things like the beauty of the natural hair, the beauty of the melanin in the skin, the beauty of the differences amongst us, and say, no, you said it was bad, but I know it's good. This is good. This is a beautiful thing, and that's what I love about you. Right. Okay. So with that being said, what do you believe is the biggest challenge in changing the perceptions of black males at the present time, at the moment? What's the biggest challenge? I say changing how we view ourselves. Uh, we, we have to understand something. Uh, I, I grew up, you know, with my grandma, you know, reading scripture to me. And so the one thing she said, you were fearfully and wonderfully created by God. And so sometimes when we see ourselves in the mirror, we are, we have, we are viewing ourselves from the, from the imprints that society has put in us of how we see ourselves. So we don't see ourselves as the king <laughs> that we were created to be. We don't see ourselves as royalty. We don't see ourselves as being innovative and, and, and standing in places that we were unqualified to be. We see ourselves in those negative, obscured, uh, abstract uh, pictures that folks put about us, you know, and, and, and that's basically it. So my thing is the way we do that is we start to change, shift how we see ourselves. When we look at ourselves in the mirror, how do you see yourself? And what do you expect yourself to be? How do you shift that thinking? when for years and years they have looked at us as a certain type of way. So what would your advice be to a young black male on how to shift his thinking when all he hears is you ain't gonna be nothing. You can be locked up by the time you get to third grade. You know, when you get to third grade, they already preparing the prison beds for you. Right, so, and so we do that by dispelling those myths, and I'm sorry to jump right oh, in. Um, that thing that we hear that they predict the number of prison beds on the New York third grade test scores is just not true, it is patently mm -hmm. false. Mm -hmm. I have a dear colleague, um, Ivory Tolson at Howard University, he mm -hmm. wrote a book called Black Folks Don't Read and Other Myths. Mm -hmm. Read it, 
because there's a bunch of stuff that we think we know that actually isn't right. So, I mean, but I'm kind of on this tip of, I don't, we're looking at water and wondering why it doesn't flow through a broken pipe. Mm. Why are we continually trying to fix the water when we need to fi fix the pipes, when we need to work on the structures that are around it? And so what does it take to shift midi media imagery? Well, let's not engage in media that does not depict us well. Why is it that black males are more likely to watch stuff on Fox? We know what they show on Fox. Why is it that they're more likely to watch videos why are they watching sports when they're boycotting, boycotting, um, oh my goodness, I'm like, um, the, you know, that, that flag issue and all that, you know, let's shift where we spend our time, you know, that when those Nielsen ratings start coming in and we start not showing up to where they expect us to be, but then end up someplace else. I love it that Sterling K. Brown won that Golden Globe Award for a role where he was a black man. They, it had to be given to a black man, to a positive black man, who is a complex figure, like, like a person, a whole person, like we, we all are. Um, I'd also like to see, I mean, this is great that we're here, um, but it needs to be shared broader. Um, and, and so, yes, we're in, maroon, I agree. We're, we're in maroon spaces here. It's a safe space, but let's take it to where other people need to, to see us in, in the beautiful hues that we are. I want to say, note, Sterling K. Brown um, is one of the leads from This Is Us. If you haven't seen it, it's the show that everyone says they're crying over <laughs> every week. So if you like to cry, tune in to This Is Us. He's also... Back to Black Panther. He's also on Black Panther. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to take yes, that question? Yes, I would definitely like to say something. Um, uh, I would like to say just read more. That is, that's the biggest challenge with um, us black males. We just got to read. Um, it's a stereotype that I have been hearing since a child. If you want to have something from a black person, put it in a book. And we need to stop that now. We need to stop that stereotype and start reading. Um, I noticed, um, I heard this from my dad. My dad said, you read more, you see more. And I used to always think about that concept. And the older I got, the more I start reading and the more I start seeing more. And it was just incredible. Um, I, how, what I do with um, my young guys, I tell them, look, if you read this book, I'll reward you. You know? And they like, oh, man, I got to read this book, man. I know Friday, I'm going to give me something to eat or something. I just take them out, play basketball. But just by reading, I can relate to them better. And that's, that's, a, big, that's a big perception on, um, on us black male and just black people in general. We got to read more. That's it. Opens your world up. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Thomas or Ms. Jones? Well, I'm going to repeat the question. What is the biggest challenge in changing the perceptions of black males at the moment? I'll say something since I haven't said anything yet. Um, I'm going to speak from the law enforcement perception. Uh, I think one of the things that would help with black males is it would be wonderful to see more black males in law enforcement. You know, I'm one of the instructors at Pitt Community College for the basic law enforcement training. And currently we have four academies going on. And out of those four academies, I believe there may be a handful of black males. Um, and that's kind of sad. You know, I get so excited when I go in and I can see black males and black females is even less in law enforcement. So one way to change the perception is to actually get out there and do something against the odds. You take a job that most people wouldn't think of a black male as a police officer, you know, and then you really can make a difference because you'll be in the community. Um, you'll automatically be able to go into certain neighborhoods and get information and change things. So I encourage the black males to actually try something different, you know, put on the suit with me. I would love to have some partners. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, so 
as a therapist, I, do, I would just like to point out this process that just happened here. Um, so we went from Reggie was talking kind of like about individual stuff, right? And then we actually moved right on up to systemic issues. So in summary, I would like to submit that the biggest challenge is that it's a systemic issue and it's actually Multi, there's multi-level processes that have to go on. So yes, you have to change your own mindset, but also you do have to push and nudge and um, challenge these systems that have um, systemically, quite honestly, kept you down. So, um, so, taking, so taking that approach and going back to kind of what you were talking about earlier, Reggie, about community and coming together, Yes, you can do things individually. One person can make a big difference, but it's much easier to take those long strides together. So I think that biggest, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is remembering you can't do it all by yourself. You have to do it all together. It's individual, but it's also macro systemic and it's going to take a long time and being patient with that process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so next. What's the question or what's the narrative or the stereotype that you hear most often and most of us have a vein that it, this kind of just came up and you're tired of hearing um and what would you like to say about it if you never had to say anything else about it again what's the thing that you're most tired of hearing about this topic black males you're tired of hearing it and the one thing you would say if you never had to say it again well, for me, the one thing would be um, often you'll hear that people will say, well, we don't have any black applicants or we don't have any qualified black applicants. Well, it's our duty to go out here and find some qualified black applicants um, in recruiting, in talking to people, in encouraging them to um, get into, say, law enforcement. So, you know, certainly, um, agencies have to take some accountability in getting out and recruiting these people. So that's one of the things that I would, am tired of hearing is that there are not any black applicants. They're not qualified. Yes, there are. We've just got to do a better job of recruiting them. Definitely. And um, I would definitely like to say, um, I don't like to hear when um, people say black men aren't gentlemen. Um, we are definitely gentlemen. Like, um, I open the door for my mama every day. I tell my mama how beautiful she is. Uh, you know, I like to motivate her. And she also, she raised me so I can treat another black woman the way, you know, once I get married, so I can treat her like that. So I want to stop that right now because we really are gentlemen. We're not all roughnecks. We don't get mad off the drop of a dime. That's not true. I mean, we, we, got, we have feelings, too. I mean, we're, we're not animals where we're immune to death. I mean, we, we cry, too, you know? And people think we're, we're so tough, like um, we're, not, we're supposed to just brush things off when it happens to us because we're black men. But at the same time, we need motivation, too. We need somebody to comfort us because, I mean, we're gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? We're strong black men, too, don't get me wrong. But I mean, we need it too. So I just want to stop that stereotype because we are gentlemen. We are. I think there's this complex thing that I bet Nisi could just rip to pieces. I have so, so much I could say about this, but I'll wait. <laughs> but there's this complex thing that happens with black males, I think, where they're soft. They're called soft when they're sometimes gentlemen, and then they have this thing, but at the same time, they're superhuman. Nothing hurts or harms them. Like this weird, complex area they have to fly in that's not real either way. So I won't get into that because I think me and Nisa could, she would break it all the way down. I would just watch her break it down. But, okay, anyone else? Is there anyone else who has something they're tired of hearing and what they want to say about it once and for all? There are more black men in prison than there are in college. Um, first of all, it's just, it's just patently false. The study that it was based on is false, didn't include a single HBCU. I yeah. mean, I, I don't even have to say anything more about it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, numerically speaking, there are far more black men who have never had a run-in 
with law enforcement than those who have. Um, we're talking about disproportionality. We see disproportionality, but then we reify that same disproportionality rather than turning the camera, turning the spotlight onto brothers who handle in there is that are good black men that go to work, that go to school, that get degrees, that are fathers and are sons and, you know, are partners. Um, they ain't in prison. <laughs> Let me repeat. Yes. There are more black men in college than in jail. There are more college educated pursuing other things than in jail. How often have you heard that? How often, my single ladies, have you heard, can't get no black man, they either all in jail, you know? Mm -hmm. See, you know, that whole rhetoric, not true. So you hear it next time you hear a sister say it, so no, 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 not true. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Um, do you believe that social media has had an effect on the perceptions of black males? And if so, how? I feel like it has a lot. Um, I feel like especially since uh, the rise of platforms such as Facebook and Twitter um, and then various news outlets, you know, we've got um, The Root, we've got uh, HuffPost and a lot of these other um, outlets that have, you know, their black voices section because we get our little section right. Um, <laughs> I think with the rise of all these outlets and the fact that it's so instantaneous, you're able to see the multiplicity and the complexity of people. There's no longer, like, it's, it's no longer valid to say there's only one stereotype out there. You actually get to see people in their, vari in their varying forms. You get to see black people, black men specifically, from different walks of life, from different geographical areas in the U.S. and in the world, and you get to see how there's different types of, um, of black people and that we feel different black and non-black things, things that just have to do with being human. Um, and so I feel like social media gives us a way to do that and we, we kind of actually have no excuse to not see those things anymore. If we don't see it anymore, it's our choice. We're, we're, cho we're willfully being ignorant. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I would definitely like to say um, social media makes black all black males. Uh, they try to make us look like thugs, um, and that concept is not true. Um, if you wear a Ferragamo belt, you're a thug. Um, if you wear a polo coat, you're a thug. Um, it's not true. All black males are not thugs. We all don't smoke. We all don't drink. We it's some it's some great black males out here, and. Um, Social media is just, it's like putting us in a box. I mean, that's all they're really doing. Um, so I catch people off guard when I take a picture and I put a positive caption. They like, oh, I thought he was a thug or something because I can relate to young people just by the way that I dress. I'm 20 years old, but I can relate to people that's 15, 16 and up and even down because it's the way that I carry myself and I know how to talk to them. But all black males are not thugs. Um, we, I mean, we're not, point blank. That's true, and that's, that's why we're here. We have to yeah. change that, Tom Act. You're supposed to be positive, right? Uh, I mean, well, you can, you can go oh. either way with that. Oh, okay. Because I said, how did it affect? Oh. So it can go either way. Well, I think oftentimes some of us black males can make people look at us a certain type of way by what we post. Um, like probably a couple months ago, <laughs> I saw a guy has stole something and then he took a picture of it, and then he posted it on social media. Um, so, I mean, sometimes we do it to ourselves. Um, but that also goes to show you that maybe he was not taught on how to handle himself in certain situations. Um, so, when I was talking to my wife about it, it all starts at home. A lot of the things that's going on now, it all starts at home. I don't know how to be a good father. I don't know how to be a good husband so to speak because I may not have always seen that so what can we do to help our young black men or our young black brothers on how to handle social media so I think yes other people have negative perceptions of us because of the things that's going on in the world but I also think sometimes we bring it on ourselves that's my opinion Lieutenant Thomas, I was just about to ask you, I know you guys had some social media 
So yes, so um, the police department is actually using social media a lot. What we're using it for is to be more transparent. And um, social media, to me, definitely has its ups and downs because some people use some people use it as a journal, as a journal where they tell you everything that they're doing, mm -hmm. and they kind of put too much information out there. And um, sometimes it, it can it can change. Even when we we do um, background investigations, you know we look at that type of stuff. So you have to think about what you're posting because it, it doesn't just go away. Even Snapchat, a lot of kids these days are using Snapchat and they think that they can just send pictures and do anything. If we need to get that, we can get it, you know. Um, all of those messages are traceable. So um, I always like to remind people that when, when you have kids in the audience, just, you know, be mindful of that. But the good parts of social media is the transparency and the fact that we can see what's going on. You know, I have seen so many positive videos, um, and it just makes me smile when I can see some black males doing some great things that I probably would have never seen before if I wasn't on social media. I agree. I think it has um, a positive and a negative impact. And it depends on how we're using it. And sadly, I think when we're, t I think, are we, could, would we agree maybe we're talking about an age group that's having some difficulty mm -hmm. with it more so than others? Mm -hmm. Dr. Chambers? Um, well, I mean, I, yeah, but that's because all people whose brains aren't quite fused, their frontal lobes aren't fused, they're all dealing with similar issues in terms of getting it together. But speaking to that male who stole something and then, posted it, regardless of what his age is, this is somebody who clearly needs attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so going back to, you know, what's in the home, you know, who's, who's loving on that person, who's showing them the attention, giving them the time of day, so they don't have to go to, so first steal something, I, I didn't get caught by the store, so now I gotta go post it on Facebook? I mean, they're craving, they're screaming for attention. Yeah, I, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 we're talking about the same thing. It was interesting to see someone actually proud of that, and you do wonder where it comes from. And, uh, and, and to piggyback off that just a little bit, I almost wonder, especially for black males, we know that one of the things they're robbed of often is their youth. And could it be that social media is ushering that process in faster for them? Like, everybody's kind of stupid at 17. I have a 17 year old. Yeah, they kind of like do crazy stuff. But with social media, like I thank God there was not social media in my day because my mama's here and she would beat my butt if, yeah, I love you, mama. But I thank God for that. But they don't have that cover anymore and then they don't know how to adequately use it. So, social media, interesting, definitely a, a further conversation. So next, in our final question, as we um, get down on time, um, what are some ways people from your industry or field are making a difference? How are they making a difference in the world, in your specific? So I would like to hear from everyone on this one. What are some ways people in your industry are making a difference in the world and in the lives of black males more specifically? And I'm going to start with Reggie. OK. Uh, Time can actually work together. So uh, a lot of times we tag team when we when we talk to our young young males. Uh, and I guess the ways we we do that is because we show up every day to work in our field as educators, and we are we remain positive and we we speak life to often dead situations. You know, uh, sometimes you got to do that because guess what? They're coming from all different walks of life when they meet us in in the mornings. When when I see them across me in the crosswalk in the morning. Uh, have a good day. Maybe the only time they've seen anything, heard anything positive from, that, from the time they woke up this morning. You will be surprised at the stories that we get on a day-to-day -day basis of why they didn't do homework or why, why they didn't you know, wear their, their appropriate clothes to school or, or, or why they just mad you know, first thing in the morning because they, they walk in mad. So what we do is we show up and we become that positive light. We speak those positive words that have to be spoken over them every day and we re redirect them into a positive way of thinking. And we have to do that because guess what? Somebody had to do it for me. Uh, I mean, I thank God for, the, for, for my dad and for the, the fathers in my life 
my dad was a, a scoutmaster for 30 years, and I, and I remember him dragging me and my brothers and our cousin and every neighborhood young male that he met to, uh, to camp. My mama would get mad sometimes because he would go pick up the, the guys that she didn't think were good influences for, for her sons to be around. But my daddy said, no, I got to show them what we're raising in our house. And so they can come back one day and say, look, you know, we want to be like those guys. We want to be like that man. And, and so and, and he was that positive impact. And I think the man I am today is because of my daddy. I know it is. He's almost 80 years old, and he's still speaking so same word of, of wisdom to me every day uh, when I talk to him. He still, he still says, son, I want you to do better than I did. You know, go further. My grandfather was only had an eighth grade education, Tanya. Um, could not read. And I remember when he died, I mean, he died reading on the eighth grade level in 1998 when he was getting ready to send me off to college. He died a week before I left to go off to North Carolina Central. And he, he had just got to eighth grade reading level because he was not able to read and get the education that he could have gotten had he not been in a, in, a, in a systemic racist society at that time that he had to grow up in. So guess what? Now is my time to impart that same wisdom to somebody else. It's like, you know, each one reach one. I agree with that, Reggie. Um, so I feel like mine is just kind of like a very cut and dry answer because uh, I'm a therapist and I don't know, we do therapy. But uh, to, <laughs> to go a little bit further with that, I think specifically with black men, um, psychology, therapy, counseling, this field, we've struggled so long because a lot of the models that we've used for a long time, and this is the, true for a lot of other fields, I think you guys can agree with me, they've been dominated by Western European thought. Um, and we use those models to teach people. And so shifting those paradigms to be more, um, uh, to, to function more within our own community for black people in the US and abroad, it's been a struggle, but that's something that we do and it's work that's so necessary in order to heal the trauma and the shame that we encounter every day. And when I think specifically about black males, I think about like the work that I do. I, for example, last weekend I was in DC holding a conference. Um, it was for black people, for black Mormons specifically, and talking to the men about it and how it felt for them to actually address the mental and emotional scars that quite frankly they've had for generations and it's been transmitted and they're still trying to deal with it. H helping them have space and to help them know that like their mental health is important um, it's been very healing for them, and that's the sort of work that we need to be doing more as a community, and not, and I mean, I say this as a therapist, so I know that this is kind of, you know, I don't know, I hope I don't get struck down, but we want to make it so that you don't need to go, like, to a therapist to figure everything out. We want to make it so that your community is able to heal you, and you also contribute to that community. From the police department, some of the things we're doing to try to reach out to young black males and black males in general, we want to start young. So some of our programs that we have, um, we have the PAL program, which is our police athletic league that reaches out to the kids that are pretty much in elementary school. Uh, we have summer camps that have, they, we, we have officers actually on site that get, they get a chance to work with the the kids and actually have some positive interactions. Um, we have SROs that are in the school. We love them and they have a huge job. Um, and they're out there with the teenagers. So hopefully the teenagers get a chance to actually meet an officer and have some positive contacts. And then the big community piece, you know, we try to make sure that we go out to as many community events. Um, if, you, if you have a community event and you would like the police department to participate, all you have to do is invite us and we, we really try to get out there because we want to make sure that we are approachable. We want to make sure that we kind of change the dynamics of what policing used to look like. Like. Um, and we really, we are bad says community policing and we really believe in it. So we want to be out in the community and we want to make sure that we're making a difference. And we have tons of programs. Um, we have Cops and Barbers. That's uh, a new program that's really big. It's, it's, we're doing really good where we're actually getting out in the barber shops and we're having those conversations. We're having conversations like this, but it's not as formal. It's an informal thing where you're getting your hair cut and if you got a question about, you know, can the police do this? 
uh, the police stop me, what should I do? We can, we can have those conversations, and it's off the record. Nobody's around. We can tell you what our suggestions are, and we can kind of work through some things. So hopefully, if you ever have an encounter again with the police, it'll be a better experience for you. So there are tons of programs that we're pushing out, and, and we would love to be involved in even more. I don't think we'll ever say no to a community program. So definitely, if you have anything, um, just invite us, and we'll be there. Um, piggybacking off what Barrett said, I think for us just to, of course I'm a teacher, so that's amazing anyway, but um, for <laughs> just being there, you won't really see too many African American males in the school system um, and giving them that love and speaking life into them, but also providing discipline, because what we see every day is kids coming in doing whatever we're thinking they're going to do whatever they want to do, talk to you however they want to talk to you, but, you know, trying to help them understand discipline. And when you are being disciplined, that's not because we don't like you. That's because we love you and we're trying to protect you. Um, some other things would be um, like our church is doing Matt's Factor where they go out to the boys in the middle schools and follow them throughout the years and teach them how to dress, teach them how to sit up in the chair, do, you know, how to eat properly or whatever. Um, and then I just recently saw something on Facebook from one of the community workers, Have Not. He had asked um, social media, which is good, to send him some money on the cash app to take 50 or 60 boys to um, the Sea Black Panther. So doing things like that is, you know, helping to change our community and the education system. Well, I knew coming behind Lieutenant Thomas <laughs> that um, she would pick up on most of the community policing um, things. Um, as you know, um, being a county employee or having um, our citizens that we deal with are in rural areas. So we don't have the um, capability of having groups um, such as cops and barbers. We don't have barber shops in the county. Um, but we do have the SROs in the school that we, we rely on heavily to build those bonds and relationships with the students in the schools. We do participate in our own national night out in, in the community, um, in, in several different communities. So we don't just have one big one. We may have one in Stokes while we have one in Grimesland, and then we'll have one in, in other areas of the county that we're running back and forth to on that night. So one of the biggest things, though, for me is to, in being an African-American, um, having little brown girls and little brown boys look at me and see somebody that looks like them. And so um, that, that's a really big thing for me, and I encourage and hope that we can have more people that little brown boys and little brown girls can look at and identify with. Definitely. Um, I want to, what I do within my organization, I, I listen. I, I listen to the kids. Uh, a lot of people nowadays don't listen to kids, and they don't know what's going on because they don't listen. I mean, you can assume all day, you know, he's acting like this because he's trying to be cool. She's acting like this because she's trying to be cute. But really all it is, they need for you to listen. You got to listen to these kids and, like, actually, like, let them know, hey, I'm here for you. Just let me know what's going on. Um, another thing, sh um, show love. Um, I, I, lo I love my mama. I, um, I told my mama, I was like, Ma, I, give, me a, um, give me a tighter hug. And my mom, my mom, she shows so much love. She's the most bubbliest woman in the world. I love my mama. And she, when she give me a hug, she, she makes... She makes me feel better because, I mean, whatever I'm going through outside, I come in and get a hug, I feel better. Another thing I want to um, tell the young, the young black males, the music. You got to be careful what you listen to because whatever you listening to, that's who you're going to portray. That's who you're going to be. And um, I can definitely relate because, I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of people, and that's probably why, the reason why I acted out at that time. But I grew out of that. So um, uh, the TV shows, stop trying to portray what you see on TV. I mean, that's reality shows. It's not real. I mean, um, we're, we're strong black men of God. I mean, that's how we got to act. 
you know. Um, another thing, like I just I got one more topic for y'all before I before I give the mic up. Um, I know I got a lot on my mind, but uh, <laughs> but uh, another thing uh, I want to say about um, black black women, um, black women show these young black girls how to dress so these young black boys can respect them, you know. Because if, if a girl wearing all this stuff, showing her body, exposing herself, us, we're not going to respect them. But the woman that, um, or the girl that, that shows who she, I mean, respects herself, that's who we're going to respect, you know? So I just want to put that out there. And, um, and I feel like the world would be a better place if we just come on one accord. And, every, and, and the last thing, this is the last thing I'm going to say. All right. Another thing. Uh, us older black males, how can I put it? I mean, teach us. Don't, don't withhold things from us. Like, show us the way, because I know you've been down this, this yellow brick road before. So show us the way. Show us how we can overcome obstacles so we won't have to go through it. Show us. And that's the last thing I want to say. Von Derek, me and Nisi are going to talk to you. At the end. Thank you. We love your babies, we promise. You're gonna get them out. Um, well, as a faculty member, my work is threefold. I do research, I, I teach, and I do service. Um, so my uh, primary focus of research is on college choice and what are the um, choices that um, students make that get them on a path towards college. And if they are not making college their choice, um, you know, what's going on. So when 60% of all people in the U.S. are choosing to go to college, that means not only A and B students are going, but then C, Ds, and some even people who flunked out of high school are getting in. So there are pathways and there's an institution for you. Doesn't mean that everybody has to go. So when, you know, systematically things aren't working for some people, trying to figure out what's going on in the pipeline. And currently I'm focusing on rural students and their college choice. Um, in fact, um, I just presented at the International Colloquium on Black Males in Education, specifically on rural education, and I'm getting ready to do a project looking um, at rural black men and their education because other than being lumped together with urban, we really don't know what's going on um, among, um, within rural communities. There's no black duck dynasty. We don't have an image for what you know black and rural is. Um, and so how do, how, how do we um, get a sense of what's going on there? So that's what I'm doing in my research. In my teaching, I try to teach, my, my students um, are all um, higher education professionals, and so I try to um, give them a um, good sense of um, the whole of, of communities, um, not just black communities, but Native American, Latino, um, Asian American communities, and so that they can appreciate all of that. And so when students come to them with their issues, that they know how to deal with them. And then um, for the fun of it, um, I, I, I got qualified to teach in political science so I can teach African American studies, the intro course. And through that, um, it's actually been um, wonderful because it directly responds to two years ago, black male students told me, nobody knows me except for when um, they want a photo op. So now I can go say, hey, Katasia, Kushan. <laughs> and and it, it scares them in class because I know them by name. Those are, those are my babies now. Um, and, and, you know, to kind of spread that. So that's touching on, on that level. And then finally through my service. Um, so I try to be available for you guys whenever you need me. And I, um, I'm relatively new to Greenville, and so I'm still looking for ways to positively engage the community. Um, as well as through um, the organization, the um, Organization of African and African American Faculty at ECU. And, you know, maybe there's a way that we can partner with Koinonia. I've seen wonderful work that's gone on here. And um, so that, you know, we're here for each other. Awesome. Thank you all. I want to say thank you um, to the panel. And hopefully they'll have a few minutes. Um, and I have a slide. Um, Cue it up, yay. All right, so things like this are really cool when we get together, right? And we have like a rah-rah session, and we're like, yeah, black men, mm-hmm. Okay, but what do I do after that? How do I um, engage, or how do I impact? What can I do 
on my micro level, right? Nisi, I looked at Nisi for my terms. Um, what can I do on my level right where I am every single day? Um, I added one as Dr. Chambers was talking, and I'll, and I'll say that one last, but so it's a call to action, what can I do? So first, affirm the black men and boys in your circle of influence. We all have a circle of influence. We all have people that we talk to on a regular basis. Even if it's the guy who makes your coffee, you, have, you are influencing that person by the way you treat them. Even if it's the guy who's standing outside of the store when you get your gas and you've never spoken to him before, speak to him tomorrow or tonight if you go get gas. Um, the, 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 the janitor, the, the guy walking to class who passes you because you're on the same schedule, uh, uh, for, recognize them. I see you, you're here and affirm to further the ones who are actually in your life on a daily basis, hey, I say take up a seven-day challenge where you don't say anything negative to them. That you, they might be getting on your nerves, but you say, you know what, I really like your haircut. That's the best you got. But you, you say something in a way that says to them, I see you in a positive way. I, I'm here for you. I, I accept I love, I acknowledge your blackness and your maleness, and you're cool with me. We're good, okay? They have a lot of negative, negativity coming in. Let's not be a part of that. Okay, we got to check people sometimes. It's cool. I understand. But that should not be the foot we always lead with is I'm going to check you, okay? And a lot of times that's happening to our black males. Next, reimagine, I kind of said in the first one, reimagine the story of a stranger that challenge your, challenges your preconceived notions. What do I mean by that? Again, let's go back to the coffee guy who for some reason you think he has an attitude. I don't know why he, hey, I didn't tell him to come work at um, Starbucks. I didn't tell him to get a job at Starbucks. Got an attitude with me, huh? Okay, reimagine that. You don't know if something happened on the way to work or that's his general affect. We all have a kind of like a resting face that's not always, sometimes it's pleasant, sometimes it's not. Um, but you don't know his story. And assign him something that's positive. So that when you see him, you're not constantly thinking of his bad attitude. And after a while, people that you're nice to, you can't help but smile at people who are smiling at you like, as well, they're going to smile like this lady's crazy. I'm going to smile at her so she'll start smiling at me or something. But reimagine the story. There's nothing wrong with that. Reimagine that story. And support agencies with a mission that includes supporting and strengthening black men and boys. Um, NC Civil is certainly an organization that I am very, very fond of. I think Mr. McNair had to leave, but he is the executive director. And is it ncsivil.org? Dot org. You can visit that for more information. Of course, I'm going to say support us. Support us. The Black Light Project, we are a nonprofit. Um, another is, of course, a Cornelia Christian Center Church is a great place for community work. We do a lot of community work. Okay? Churches get a bad rap, and that's really nice to put that on the news about the pastor has a new catalog. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. That, that's, that's, no. That's another narrative we could talk about. We're going to talk about real community churches who are in the community, boots on the ground, out shaking hands, bringing people in, feeding, loving, teaching, encouraging, lifting, doing more than giving fish, but teaching to fish. That's this. So that is the heart of what we do here. Koinonia means fellowship, and it is indeed a, a ship where we fellow and hang out together. Okay? Um, and finally, that is not up. Oh, be present. Black males, thank you, Von Derek, for saying that. Black males, be who you are and be present. I'm here. The older black males, teach the younger. Show them the way, some that are lost. Be, be transparent about your mistakes. Be there. Grab on to a young black man who's fallen away, like he said his father did. Oh, he's bad. Um, I think um, he's left, but Quayshawn said, no, he's right there. Quayshawn said, we teach this thing, you get the knowledge and you leave. No, 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 get the knowledge and go back and teach them so that they know what to do. If you have 
a master's degree in whatever. Grab a couple kids who are interested in what you're interested in. Find some organizations that do what you do. Most companies have um, outreach that they're doing. If your company doesn't have outreach, you start that outreach. Even if it's just you and two kids once a month, how you can impact lives, be present. And finally, um, choose positive media. Dr. Chambers referred to that. What are you drinking in? It has, it's playing on the psyche. It is what we're constantly pumping into our brains and our minds. What are you drinking in? Choose media that really is almost like what you want to get out. It's look at it as I want this to be what I get out of the situation. So this is what I choose. You know, it, it can be hard. Some music, you know, Cardi B is, you know, easy to listen to. It's easy, easy listening. But y'all know who Cardi B is, right? Okay, we're in church. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> so I like Cardi B, but by and large, 90% of what I listen to is positive. It's motivational. It's spiritual. It's uplifting. And it's encouraging. So 90% of the time, my response to you is going to be that way. Now, I'm sorry if you do catch me on a Cardi B day. That's 10% of the time. But again, what you put in is what you get out. So I encourage you. For more information, please visit theblacklightproject.com. You can certainly, you know, inquire about hosting events like this. Um, I want to say again, thank you to our panel so much um, for coming and sharing. There's so much to this, so I hope we'll have another opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I want to let you know that in the fellowship hall, if you walk out of those back doors and go to the left, there will be someone to direct you. We actually have 19 pieces of photography that were shot by black males. I want you to know that the, um, every part of this project was put together, was done by a black male. Aside from, yes, uh, even my makeup was done by a black male. No joke. Aside from the voiceover work, and the my part where I just facilitate it. It was all done by black males. They are talented. They are so beautiful and wonderful. And that's what I want you to see. So please don't leave without seeing the absolute amazing talent of these photographers. Bryce Chapman, Randy Curtis, right from Eastern North Carolina. Videography was done by Mr. Durham Marshall. We have other projects who work on together. Music was done by Mr. Branson Edwards, also known as Big Bougie. Um, makeup by Jarrell Fullerton, he's also one of the subjects. Um, any questions, I'm here, I will be here. You can certainly take a picture uh, with the pop-up we have here. And I hope, like I said, that they'll hang around. If you have any questions for me, I thank you all so much for being here. It means the world to me to see all of your beautiful faces. Have a great evening.